Welcome back, guys. So, we pick up from uh, where we'd left. You are at MSK, and then that is when you were approached by the Brand Kenya team. Um, yes, I mean, we were already part of the team. Um, by virtue was, of being uh, in MSK? Uh, no, it was actually a group of friends, but um, obviously most of us were already knew each other from MSK. Um, at the time, Brand Kenya was actually started by um, Paul Kakubo, um, Patricia Itao, um, Jane Delory, and then Al Kags and myself were pulled in. So Brand Kenya yeah, actually started in a garage. This was being done at the Three Mics offices. I don't know if many people remember Paul Kakubo, an amazing guy, uh, you know, the IT guru, that's what I call him uh, when it comes to um, tech and, and marketing and, and the tech space. And um, it, we used to go to his um, uh, garage at his offices, and that's where we started Brand Kenya. So Brand Kenya started as an idea. Um, there was, uh, I mean, it was it was invested in uh, financially, also personally by by Paul and, and Patricia and Jane initially. Uh, we got in touch with IMC South Africa. We're working on it, and uh, Brand Kenya then became a reality to the point that we were now reporting to the president of Kenya at the time, it was uh, President Kibaki. And we used to then, we even went to present it at State House. It was also put in under the care at the time, I remember it was Rafael Tuju, if I'm wrong, who was the Minister of Communication. So it was something that was happening. It was it was going and then, uh, yeah, next thing I'm seeing now, you know, Brand Kenya is under the government and uh, I'm trying to figure out what they're doing with it because I don't see anything that is happening from uh, branding Kenya and um, especially even now uh, more so. I mean, I saw yesterday something about Kenya was voted about amongst um, the top countries. It's the number one right now in terms of uh, tourism and obviously in the COVID period. I'm like, really? You know, um, I don't know where that came from. But uh, with the kind of negativity I see on Twitter every single day right now on Kenya and dejection and, you know, all the stuff with politics and all this, this is the kind of stuff Brand Kenya needs to be working on, you know, and this is where marketers, whether it's MSK, whether it's Stock Marketers Club, uh, you need to be sitting uh, right now with, with government, you need to be a part and the arm of the government so that we are careful about the kind of things that we're putting out there and the kind of image that we're putting out, you know, for Kenya. Um, you know, right now I know Amina is going to stand up for the WTO and, you know, all the best Amina um, against Nigeria. But today when you look at it, remember the gone of the days when Nigeria was seen um, in, in a negative light. Today Nigeria is the happening place. Whatever investment anyone wants to think of, they think of Nigeria. But when you look at Kenya, we're so advanced, we're so ahead in so many ways. Um, but we still want to present ourselves under magical Kenya. And we want to talk about wildlife and tourism, and we want to use uh, an athlete as a brand ambassador for a country. Isn't there so much else that we can be talking about? So these are the questions that you know I'd like to ask the Brand Kenya team, because when we started Brand Kenya, that's not what Brand Kenya was supposed to be doing. We were supposed to be involved and right down to the ground level in terms of what is the voice of the people. You know, whether it was a market seller, whether it was a a, a church priest, whether it was a minister, whether it was a teacher, whether it was a parent, whether it was a student, what are the voices of, of Kenyans? You know, that determines what is the positioning for Kenya. Right now, it's it's not uh, it's not seamless across. So yes, um, I think Red Kenya needs to have a revisit, and um, they need to be realigned, and um, they need to either bring in the original owners or a team of fresh marketers, and it needs to take. Um, MSK and Top Marketers Club to be a part of it again to re look at what is rebranding Kenya about. Wow, interesting. I didn't know that when it's that when Brand Kenya started started out like an independent entity which was presented to government, and then now it's a government. I guess it's a government yes. for our status. And I think under the five minute, people, five people, but in honesty, in honesty, it was actually started by Paul, Patricia, and Jane Delore. They were the first three people. Uh, Jane Delory was PR, PRSK chair, uh, Paul Kubo was MSK chair, Patricia was MSK chair, I had been MSK chair, then you had Al Kags um, in there. And you can talk to them. I mean, if you speak to all of us right now, if you ever got us together, we will tell you what Brand Kenya um, was all about, what it could have been and what it should be. Um, so it was just a passion. And this is what I was talking about, right? For marketers, we have to just come in together, create our own passion 
and if, as long as you have a can do mindset and a can do approach we can do a lot of things we don't need to depend um, on entities to make us relevant you know we are the people we're the movers we're the shakers we can uh, build a country we can uh, uh, build a brand we can build a build a, a person's image so we are responsible for everything and we have to be integral in everything that happens I'm thinking of having you all on a panel <laughs> <laughs> I think you should you should have all of the old marketers the old the old boys club. Yeah, I guess this is a series we've been missing. I, I wouldn't have known uh, and I guess most of us wouldn't have known that Brand Kenya initially started out as as an independent venture. These are the stories we need being told um, out there. Yes. What do you what do you make of marketing associations in Africa? Because here we have MSK, we recently started out. Um, and then when you look at the fact that most awards are not African-based, if I can put it that way, what, what do you yes. make of marketing yeah. associations? But there are two questions you asked there, you know, in one question. Yeah. So my honest opinion, and I should not be killed for this, I just think marketing associations right now have become a political arm. Uh, you know, and that's what they are right now. Um, just as much as uh, we have political um, arms, you know, fighting for uh, elections to be presidents, um, we also have those kind of clicks happening in marketing associations right now. I and mean, you see certain positions where people are perennially, um, you know, the chair or the president or whatever, you know, uh, how does that happen? Where is democracy? Where is uh, the change? And then you come to the awards, um, forget even, let's forget even the, the awards. I saw recent um, Africa awards that happened. And I remember put, talking, I think the top 100 brands of Africa, and I put it up on my LinkedIn and none of the brands were African. They were all um, international brands that are operating in Africa. Yet we have brands, even if you just took a simple thing like M-Pesa, you know, created in Kenya by Kenyans um, running in, in, uh, in uh, forget the fact that it's a part of an organization, but M-Pesa is, you know, um, today M-Pesa is where is being used in Afghanistan of all places to to pay salaries. You know, it is also being used in Europe as a platform. We we have all this amazing. We've got Mpopa going, you know, Kiondos and stuff like that that I talk about uh, before somebody else again comes in and um, creates patents for them in other markets. Um, we have so much that is going on, but these brands do not come in the forefront. Why? Is it because they're not advertised? Is it because they're not marketed? I want somebody to go to the, you know, Wanjiku and ask, what are the brands that you use? You know, and you'll be surprised that a lot of them don't necessarily have to be these brands that are coming in from the international space. A lot of brands are Kenyan brands that are being used um, in the market. So we need to start getting at least within the Kenyan space. Uh, whether it's Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, let's start celebrating our own brands first and then take it to the next level. Because if we don't speak about our brands, obviously you're going to go to an international platform. I don't want to mention the companies or the names, but you're going to continuously perennially see those brands um, being featured in the awards, which is um, unfair uh, um, and um, and not, not right. It's not the reality on the ground. So, so if you ask me in, 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 in all honesty, uh, we, we need to relook really at what we're doing. We need to bring integrity. We need to bring uh, authenticity in what we do, whether it's in terms of awarding and also in terms of, uh, you know, the association and what its uh, reason for being is. I mean, we know like for every brand, there's got to be a reason, a purpose for its existence. So we can't just be an organization that is just about membership and getting numbers and, and then that's it and running an, a gala and an award. Where are we? Where are we? The the voice of what should be happening. I remember during our period, you'd be surprised. Um, I was also we apart from MSK, we also had the Advertising Standards uh, Council. I don't know if uh, committee if that still exists in Kenya right now. Um, and uh, I was one of the people that was fully responsible as head of uh, of MSK that drove the agenda about. Uh, and took it to parliament. I was one of the people, in fact, the, the, the head driver of it. And I brought in EABL and brought in uh, BAT on board. We 
worked with clients together and we stopped advertising we took it to parliament because there was nakada nakada was driving this whole aspect of you know drug abuse and alcohol abuse and xyz we worked with nakada we worked with the clients and msk and the advertising standards council put in a paper to parliament where we were able and with the media agency as well with the media council we came in together and we agreed and created a policy where alcohol advertising for example was not going to take place during the day and it was going to be running um, i think it was after eight or nine in the evening so if we could have done that during our period what is stopping us doing that right now where are we in terms of advocacy where are we in terms of policy where can we say as marketers and i don't want to say this is just about msk um all the marketers where you know the, the different councils whether it's prsk media council msk top marketers where are we today in making decisions that are relevant for the uh the the, the country in terms of policy in terms of advocacy in terms of protection of consumer rights um you know COFEC, why are we not working with them together so we're all working as different and separate entities when we should be coming in together and doing things in, in, in the interest of marketing, in the interest of consumers and customers, you know, and to be able to have a voice and say at parliament, to have a voice and say at the table when policies are being discussed. I like that bit of having them come together. It's like nowadays we have every P <laughs> having an association of its own. But I guess they should find a, a, a areas of because uh, <laughs> we we actually have different bodies. You have the PR having their society. Nowadays, you also have customer service having their own society. Then you have the marketers. It's kind of, I, uh, we had a. I'm not. Dis, I'm, I don't want discredit or disrespect any current ones because I don't know them. I honestly. I am not in touch with what's happening in in, uh, in in the current associations in Kenya. During our period, if I know Fatuma Hirsi, for example, was the chair of PRSK at the time, also there was Indy Lori. PRSK, MSK worked together. Um, Media Council, we were all sitting together. When I'm saying we had an Advertising Standards Council that even created a policy for Parliament, you know, we tabled a paper. That's how powerful we were, you know. What, what has stopped us now? Why are we separate? Why are we working in different directions? Why why don't I ever see anything online? I don't see things coming out from um, the you know media council of Kenya unless obviously the government has come in to say okay we're not allowing newspapers to say X Y Z. That's when we see the media council come together. Or when a journalist has been beaten up, that's when we see the media council coming in together. Where are we today in all the conversations? We're not participating in any of the conversations that are happening in the country. Yeah, that needs to change. I'll take you now to awards. You, ah. You've really been showered with awards <laughs> during your illustrious career. And um, you've been honored as one of the top 50 CMOs, Global Award in Singapore, as well as uh, top 100 most talented marketers, uh, Global Award in India. Tell us about these awards and how you found yourself there? Uh, you know, I wouldn't want to talk much about them because, quite frankly, I don't think they make me. Um, they just, they just uh, basically. I mean, awards for me is basically somebody somewhere there thinks that you've done something better. I believe that there are people who are much better than I am. People who are deserving of a lot more um, recognition and awards. But I guess maybe because they have not been seen, they probably haven't marketed themselves well. Um, they have not been in the right networks, the right forums, and maybe that's the reason they have not been given that. There are some amazing people out there who I believe should get it. Um, for me, what all I can say is I am I'm very grateful, and uh, I know one of the things that I'm only waiting for is a United Nations Award. And I want it to be an award where through my marketing skills, I've been able to lift humanity. And that is when I would say I have achieved it. And take it from me, Victor, because it is one of the things I have on my
we seem to have lost Fatima or am I the only one I think we lost her Victor yeah she's ah she's back I don't know what happened sorry um yep this is um Vodafone for you but anyway um yeah the the I think probably the award that made most sense to me was the win trade um in London this was an award um that was given and you won't believe I had to go to the parliament of London I had to have tea and scones with silverware oh my god <laughs> um sitting in parliament um in in the in the outskirts of parliament at the Westminster Abbey in London um and um for me that was a, a great achievement because to be seen in the outside world as having been made been able to make a difference and again like i rightly said it's because of the stuff that i do that goes out um on different social media platforms um and was picked for that i i i i can't believe that having gone on that platform there were some amazing people i think there was there were people from google there were people from apple and to have beaten them head, hands down for me that was the ultimate um I think 2 days later there was another award while I was in London that I was nominated for and it was Women for Africa and I did not stand a chance. I remember my friends family, you know, all were there. I did not believe I had could stand a chance because there were amazing people out of Nigeria, from Rwanda, uh there was Kenya as well and to have heard my name and stand up and go up there again. I I believe I I remember even standing up and crying because I didn't think I was worthy of it. um it's not that i think i should sell myself but i believe there there are better people out there but for me those two um uh, stood out i i mean being among the top 50 or the top 100 for me doesn't do anything because i believe uh when you look at the base or the number of people they might have assessed or judged from uh may not have been uh, a true reflection i am honored i am humbled i am grateful to have been considered for it but i still believe there are other people out there and i would love to still be considered to be amongst the top yes but for me the other ones where you can be able to assess it against what you've been able to do you've been able to see the change somebody is able to come on the ground and say okay i have seen what you've done that for me is what i hold close to my heart i'm guessing that's the iconic woman building a better world award um yes that's another one i got one i think in march just before the shutdown which was in uh, in egypt Yes. um and again like came through because of a lot of stuff that I do all my clients will tell you every client that I work with the big question is how are you going to be able to lift humanity with your brands how are you going to be able to reach the bottom of the pyramid enough of this stuff of trying to sell brands to people and telling them that it's going to make you smell good or you know uh, uh it's quick and it's fast I want to know what you're doing for the common man at the bottom of the pyramid. How are you addressing in Kenya for me right now the 100 shillings segment? How are you able to say that you have a brand that is going to make their lives better and you're going to be able to reach them? That's what I'm interested in. Do you think this COVID period provides brands that opportunity to actually move from from that from that commercial aspect we we had a a webinar uh, where we saw that we have citizen brands do we definitely i mean definitely we need to do that but again i'll just give you a quick um example when i was working with sab miller where they were my clients when i was at young and ruby camp at that time citizen beer i don't know if it, any one of you who's on the on, on this thing who knows it remember citizen beer citizen beer came out at the time and it had a Uh, the TV commercial was showing all these Kenyan citizens walk, walking and it was about the bottom of the pyramid so you're just seeing guys you know fundies and um guys who were contractors all working together like what you meant okay you know in the evening to have a beer and you're just seeing guys doing cheers and whatever if i told you victor we did a research and do you know what the research showed that when people were having citizen beer they used to peel the label okay they peeled the label because they were embarrassed to be seen drinking it but they drank it because it was affordable to them okay so as uh SAB and uh, when I was lo- working with the the client side we came up with a beer called Hansa and Hansa Lager for Castle Brewing at the time we created a uh, uh, sorry Ranger it was called Ranger uh brand 
and the Ranger brand had a badge. It was like a, an army badge. It was black. It was built. The label was created on gold foil um, and silver foil put together. Um, it was about prestige um, image. The, com the communication campaign showed different strata of people. It showed people who were progressive and aspirational. Do you Ranger and EABL can tell you about this. Ranger took them for a run because we created a brand that was aspirational that people could look up to. Whereas in Citizen was holding a mirror to people and saying, this is who you are, this is who you reflect. Uh, I mean, Citizen Beer was, this is you reflect to. Consumers don't want to be told that this is who you are. And that's what we need to also understand during this pandemic and COVID. Do not go out selling brands to people and tell them, oh, because you know, you're know you at the poor level of the strata, you are a common man, uh, you can only afford this. And then you start showing images of people um, in that kind of lifestyle. It's That's the wrong thing to do. It's like the same thing with CSR. I keep telling people, you know, it was one of the things, I think it was Vimal that had talked about this, uh, where we talked about CSR being cosmetic social responsibility, where people wanted to give, but they wanted to take photographs to be seen as they were giving. And that was more about cosmetic. Um, when you're going to help a person and give him shoes because he didn't have shoes, and then you tell the world that you went and helped that person and gave them shoes, you've actually told the, the world that the guy never had shoes and he was poor. Did that, was that something that the world needed to know? You've actually put the person in a space of shame and embarrassment instead of helping him. The Bible says it, the Quran says it, when the right hand gives, the left hand doesn't need to know. So there's another way of doing this kind of things from a marketing perspective without having to bring people to a level where they have to feel embarrassed about themselves. And that's what we need to do also with our brands. This, this uh, period is actually showing opportunity for us to create brands that can be able to reach the less privileged, the, the people who right now have lost their jobs. You know, there are people who are stopping using the brands that they're using because they cannot afford it. They're downsizing, you know, either on SKU levels. So as marketers, this is what we need to be thinking and saying, how can I be able to reach the, these people who are right now being hit so hard? It should stop being about commercial. It should stop being about profit. Profit will always come in at the end, but we need to start understanding the needs of the consumers. Talking about the needs of uh, the consumers, do you think most marketers have shunned research? Is it that uh, marketers are afraid of numbers? Because with research comes numbers. Research, research, research is so crucial. Um, again, like I said, you know, in the start of the program, a lot of times you find organizations preferring to decide what the problem is in the market, you know, oh, and then they tend to do a lot of knee jerk reaction and stuff because a competitor is doing something that they want to get in that space. There's a difference between a need and a want. Okay, want always comes in from an aspect of uh, a greed or luxury or, you know, taking getting something extra. A need is addressing a problem. Okay, so we need to look at what is the solution that my brand will be able to give you. And data is crucial, but data cannot just be data. Data needs to be converted into information and then it needs to be converted to intelligence. Otherwise, it's just going to be numbers that you're just going to see on a graph or an Excel sheet, but doesn't tell you nothing. If you don't convert it to intelligence, when you convert data to intelligence, it will be able to tell you what's really happening on the ground. It should be able to also tell you what your competitors are doing, because if you see all of a sudden something happening, you see a shift, you see a growth in a certain market share, that should be able to tell you that, wait a second, is there a change in formulation? Was there a change in uh, demographic? Was there a change in terms of where they were selling? So you that should be able to tell you instead of just looking at it and saying okay wait a second oh this is showing me i've got great market share you know that's the other thing a lot of marketers have not understood the difference between market share sales share production share you know so a lot of times people will look at their data and they'll say oh wait a second i sold you know a million tubs this month and uh, i know my competitor is selling uh, you know around 800 uh, thousand tubs so we're number one that's not true because that is just your production share that's what you've, you've been able to produce um, then you have the sales figure you know and they will say out of my million you know i've been able to sell into the trade 800 whereas my competitor might have sold in 700 so you have your sales share market share is the only time where you're able to say that are you truly a leader in the market and that's based on the consumer picking your product to consume it okay and that's why you know um people like Qatar, nielsen you know all this uh, uh retail audit data is where we should be looking at saying where are you really performing uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, uh, companies, um, especially the, 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 the local companies do not do things like brand health check. You know, where are you in, 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 your, in your brand health? 
they only just want to go and buy data to just know competitor shares where we are at I, I i'm just sitting there and saying my friends you need to take data and convert it to intelligence it has so much in there that can be able to tell you um, the future forget about what's happening right now it can tell you the future and it can direct you as to where you need to go ah nice i think i'll follow up with a question from esther who's asking uh, from your perspective what is the one strategy that makes b2b marketing a success i mean there's there's no one strategy business to the business right now is just as good as b2c because you've got to remember that a business is also a customer or a consumer to you because they're going to have to consume what you're what you're you're doing so the strategy is no different from the other but again it totally depends in which line of b2b you're in are you in the tech space are you in the manufacturing space um are you in custom service space the strategy will totally depend on each one but for me b2b is always going to come in first from the perspective of um integrity um it's going to come in from customer service it's going to come in from the angle of um authenticity because b2b is unlike b2c where you have have other um, intermediary channels before you reach the consumer a b2b is face to face you're dealing with that person on a one to one so that's where i think honesty and integrity first comes in of the business and of what it is that you're selling um, to to that business if you're able to break that uh, barrier then everything else comes in as a win win after that so like i rightly said if the strategy will totally depend on what kind of uh, business you're talking about it can be very specific Uh, I'd be able to help you on that. Thank you. I, I hope Esther, your question has been answered. And if you don't Esther. want to Hi Esther. And if Hi, you Fatima. don't want to ask actually drop me an email if you think it's confidential and I can help you on that as well. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Okay. Now I guess we can jump to a bit about your personal. Hey. What what, what does, do you want to know? <laughs> I feel like you've traveled a lot. Um how easy was it for you to move to to Ghana? Um I don't know. I like I told you, I'm just a person who just does things. I have no fear. I mean, I was moved from I moved from London to Kenya. and then Kenya to um you got to to Jinja in a village and then next thing was I go coast and here I travel the world I can't wait for our borders to open because we're still shut I literally live on the plane Victor I am on a flight uh, in a month I think I'm on a flight um at least 3 uh, weeks a month um so you can imagine with covid I have been grounded so at one point I actually got close to fall because like oh my goodness you know I love going to markets I love going and sitting with people i mean if you follow me you will actually realize i'm the kind of person who goes and sits sits on a little you know kabao or a ta- or a tire i will be talking to you know even the market women sellers coming to jaribu kitu wamekula wametengeza i will eat i have no fear of nothing you know um i will hug people and i think that's the reason market places exist you know unlike the foreign foreign countries um the reason in africa our markets still exist is because there's a personal touch there's a personal communication you can go and ask somebody you know mama leo ni aje uko na shida you know what's happening uh, what is going on you're able to connect you are able to get credit you know you're able to do things and that's the personalization um that exists that's now the challenge comes in for marketers you know with e-commerce coming in and coming into take place how can we ensure that continuity and this is why i am so anti this whole bot system you know people using bots to respond to chat bots you type to somebody and facebook will you know a company and then a chat bot comes and respond it's so impersonal you know so we need to find ways and whoever's going to come in with that solution i can tell you you're going to make lots of money um you know how can we c- still maintain that that personal con- uh, contact with with our consumers with our trade with our customers um so for me playing um is like reading a book it opens me to so much and uh, Yeah, there's just so much out there to learn and I can't wait back to get back um out there. And of, of course, if you're asking again on a personal front, yes, I'm very much single. Um I have an 18-year-old daughter. Um but I'm not looking. <laughs> I'm not looking. I'm not looking. <laughs> um 
what's the most memorable campaign? And uh, as 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 we wind up, anybody who has a, who has a question can actually now um, unmute themselves and ask. Okay, first and foremost, now. Um, so very quickly, you know, I was on the, I don't know how many are old generation here, they'll be able to tell you. I used to be, I, I, there was a Chipsy advert that ran that was there for Bitco many, many, many years ago. And it was about how to make chapati. So I'm the Swahili lady who used to say, Una sokotam bitko, you know, uh, so many people know that I'm not Swahili. So <laughs> to be able to connect, roll and say to the Swahili accent is amazing. Um, for me, um, one of the greatest campaigns that I would say I've worked on is a brand called Fortune. It was Uganda and it was about an oil drop story and it was about how this oil drop impacted um, various people right down from the forklift um, person to the person who planted um, the seed all the way to the end of the consumer. And another one was in South Africa and this was just after the World Cup and the client wrote me an email saying, Fatima, He's a South African and he said, for the first time as a South African, I would like to stand up and sing the national anthem because you have been gifted by God. Um, this campaign um, resonates with me as a South African. Um, unfortunately, I can't share that with you because you didn't even know um, the campaign, but it was for um, a, a brand in, in South Africa. Nice. Anybody got a question for Fatima? And anyone wants to shoot me an email separately, um, they can always do that. Yeah, so I'm going to share Fatima's LinkedIn profile actually in the chat section. Oh, thank you, Joseph. If it's if it's the Kimansi that I know, um, then Habariako, it's uh, very long. Um, if, if it's not the Kimansi, then it's good to meet you. Um, all I can just say, Victor, because I know we have limited time, but like yeah. six minutes. Uh, what I would love us to do is, you know, there's just so many amazing stories out there. There are amazing people that have been on this journey. Um, you know, very rightly, like if you look at politicians as well, um, history always has people that you can um, relate to, that you can go back to. I'm not saying I'm the greatest, but um, all I can say is I've walked a journey. If my shoes could tell a story, they would be able to tell you of stories of places that have been you know, markets that I've visited, um, the kind of connections that I've made with people and lives that I've been able to touch. I'm not the mother Teresa, but all I can say is that I believe that my journey is to actually through brands, be able to make a better world, um, tell a better story and to break away from this fear psychosis that uh, we have, you know, whether it's organizations or as marketers, um, you know, we, we just need to know that we need to go out there and we have a purpose. We are storytellers, we are game changers. We we are the ones that define everything that is being consumed, whether it's your light bulb, whether it's your shoe, whether it's your sanitary napkin, it's your toothpaste, my goodness, we're the ones who create all that. So why are we not telling the stories? Why are we not on the table, you know? And forget it, if we're not being brought onto the table, let's bring our own damn table and create our own uh, voice would love to hear about one particular failure that you had and we learned to remedy it. Wow, um, I'm not being obnoxious, but um, I've been blessed. I haven't, haven't to date had any failure yet. Um, not that I can think of, no, no. I guess maybe because a lot of the stuff that I've worked on have come in from a space um, of my heart. Um, and they've always come in from the perspective of the consumers. So touch with there hasn't been one yet. Um, and I hope there isn't any, but I still believe that if there are any, I will learn from it. I will learn from it. It's always a learning curve, but there hasn't been any. Um, yep, yeah, truth be told, none. All I can say is that, um, and this is a fact, any brand that I've worked on, any client that I've touched, and brands that have, as of to date, they've all had number one market share. Um, it has either been luck, it has been a blessing, or it's probably knowing the right strategy. But of course you do have some clients that try to make sure that they stop you achieving what you want to achieve because um, of fear or are scared of taking the risks. Yep, you're right. Uh, it's the commands you know. <laughs> oh, it's the commands you know, okay. <laughs> 
I think I'm pleased to, to let guys know that Fatima will be joining us at the Marketers Conference in December. So where she will be able to share more insights yes. uh, on how to get your brand to be number one. <laughs> oh, great. I'm happy to see that you, you know Femi. Okay, great. I will, I will let Femi know. Femi and I work very closely together um, on, um, on various research and also on super brands. Did you work on super brands when you were in Kenya? Or are you working um, from I'm outside? I am a representative for super brands in Ghana. We oh. just released results um, the day before yesterday. So we're just about to release it on media next week. Wow. African brands, I hope. <laughs> uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> totally yeah, African. Interested in African brand, brands yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so if uh, nobody else has a question, I want to take this time to thank Fatima for taking her Sunday out to share her journey with us today. Uh, very inspiring, lots of lessons that you have shared, insights uh, which are really um, invaluable and which if we put to practice, we can get to the next level. I also hope to have a record like yours, no failures. <laughs> we hope to we hope to beat that. Failures are important. Yeah. I, 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 if you ask my personal life, I have, I have very many failures on a personal uh, front, and you learn from it. I think failures are important, but I guess I've just been blessed to, like I said, coming in. I come in from a space of authenticity, and I come in from a space of understanding the pain point. I try to put myself um, in the shoes of my consumer and I try to look at it from that angle. So whatever I do always comes from that space. So sometimes I do get emotional about it. And that's why I believe even in campaigns, if they're not emotional, I'm not interested. They've got to have an emotional connect. Um, and I'm not a believer of demographics. I'm a believer of psychographics because that's where everything happens. That's where uh, things happen. Things happen in the head and they happen in the heart um, in terms of why consumers choose what they choose. So great, I can see we have less than a minute. Yep. Um, from my side, I can Santa Sana Um And thank you very much for connecting me back home. Um, it feels really good. Uh, it really feels good. Always a pleasure to connect with fellow marketers and hear the story.